All right, and we're doing dill tie. Um, um, again, working uh, on the essay out of, uh, by the core on the task of hermeneutics out of this volume. Um, and, uh, in case you, you don't know, if, if uh, the arguments I'm making here are developed vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, philosophical theology, uh, which means um, doing spirituality within the bounds of what is uh, considered to be generally reasonable, so uh, within the bounds of philosophy. Um, this, this book has more detailed arguments for what I'm going to do here in application, um, as, as does my agape ethics. Uh, so just that as a reference. All right. Um, so Diltai. Um, Diltai. Uh, we're moving from Schleiermacher to Diltai. And uh, by the time we get to Dilti, um, uh, uh, as, as Ricoeur says, we have two great developments in the 19th century. You can see that Dilti is born around the time when Schleiermacher dies. So Schleiermacher is at the beginning of the 19th century. And, and Dilti is, is writing his, his, um, his, 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 his most significant works uh, towards the end, uh, in the beginning of the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th uh, century. So the first thing is, is the emergence of history um, as a science. Um, and so um, it, in a sense, this is the modern sense of history. It's, it, it's because of the developments that we're studying um, um, that modern sense of history as, as giving a uh, objective, dispassionate account of the matter um, just as it happened. So that um, if you were to compare, say, biography in the modern sense, which is to give the history of a person uh, and their life and to present them just objectively, this is who they were and, and, and what they did, in contrast to a, a um, ha ha hagiography, uh, which is written in, in an attempt to praise the person who written for an agenda. Um, or maybe you think of um, Josephus's history of Rome, which is a history but written uh, in part to justify um, and, and um, 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 put in a good light the Roman Empire, right? So, um, so that's, that's the difference. We're, we're thinking the modern sense of, of how the Genesis creation accounts come to be seen as really, uh, if you're going to take them seriously, and this kind of can, can be shared by people who think in modern terms who are, who are both uh, Christian and, and people who reject Christianity, they'll often share the modern sense that, that what those Genesis creation accounts are doing is history, uh, and that's the way to take them seriously, so they have to be interpreted as literally uh, true which is not, once again, uh, how they were interpreted um, in the patristic period, um, let alone um, in the ancient Hebrew period. Um, uh, or think of the Gospels. It's, it's not an accident that you have in the 19th century uh, within Christian scholarship the rise of the quest for the historical Jesus. Right. So you're going you're gonna to look through these Gospels and see if you can determine using them and whatever other contemporary texts you, you can you know what? Who was the historical Jesus really? Where you get the the red letter editions of Scripture, where these are the, the words of Jesus, the actual words, and then you get scholars doing a, a project where they try to figure out, okay, well, what words in these Gospels and in, in all the other Gospels that are available from that time, what are criteria for saying, okay, these are actually the words of Jesus? Um, and I showed you before um, a list of sayings from other sources which look by all these criteria, even from the perspective of the most conservative scholars, to be the actual words of Jesus. So it's this, it's this emergence of, of history in this modern sense, where to take the gospel seriously is to read them as, as, as more or less accurate history, um, which is a question whether that really is a genre mistake vis-a-vis uh, -vis both the Gospels and the creation accounts, and really a genre mistake which is um, modern, a consequence of this birth of history in the modern sense. Um, you might also think of Foucault's claim, Michel Foucault's claim, um, that he was only always doing history, just laying out the facts of the matter um, with no other uh, purpose, no other agenda, except just to say, the. but 
you know, the, the, the contradictions here are rife once again with this um, uh, secular figure because the reason people prize Foucault is because of the way in which he tends to unveil how various marginalized communities, uh, those who consider are considered um, insane or criminally insane, those who are imprisoned, those who are seen as um, sexually uh, deviant, um, Foucault unveils how these uh, various folks are marginalized in discriminatory ways and how our rationality is built up, which justifies a discrimination towards them. That's why his work is celebrated by scholars, um, which is in is considerable tension with his claim uh, that all he was doing was history, was just laying out history. Um, now, nowadays, most of us would be somewhat cynical. Um, well, maybe not, but, but, but I think of late, most even scholars and historians would be cynical of the idea that there is such a thing as an objective perspective on history, that, that, that there's a way, that in fact, all history to some degree betrays, um, uh, even at an unwitting level, uh, the prejudices, the perspectives of its authors, and will tend to justify and make normative some narratives um, and to marginalize and, and make aberrant, aberrant um, other narratives. Uh, that, that realization, uh, uh, the justification for it, is, is a product of, of, of the hermeneutics we're studying um, and the critical theory um, in conversation with it that we'll be studying. But the notion of history that it defeats, the notion that his, what history should be is just an objective, dispassionate telling of the facts, how they happen. Um, the, the notion that history in any substantive way, I mean, we might be able to say, okay, New, New, um, Napoleon was an emperor, Napoleon existed at this time. I mean, there, there, there are aspects of the history which will be in any responsible historical account. But, but the, the nuance, the more um, substantive interpretation of the significance of a Napoleon, the relationship of the Napoleon to the French Revolution, the relationship of the French Revolution and Napoleon to uh, current um, uh, political understandings and dynamics. Uh, the idea that all of that, in terms, in terms, in other words, the more substantive you get, the more significant your historical analysis becomes, the more in particular it's going to become, which means by definition, the the less um, objective um, um, it will be in that modern sense. Um, now, that's one sense, and that, that's going to be this, this ideal realized within history, and, and you get similar ideas in, ideals in psychology and others of what will be called the human sciences, of, 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 of being critical in that modern epistemological sense, in the Kantian sense, of, of, of knowing what you know, um, not being subjective, not being prejudiced, but, but giving a certain objective knowledge as best as possible. That becomes the ideal, and, and that's an ideal that arises, um, uh, and a desire arises in the historical sciences um, as, as, as it had in uh, for the, uh, the uh, natural sciences uh, before this period. And so uh, that's where, um, if we think of uh, uh, Kant's critique of pure reason, explaining how we can have certainty, how we can have a priori synthetic judgments in science, uh, giving a logic to explain. Uh, now, again, this eventually we undercut this, but it, it's very influential, especially in this period, giving um, a logic to explain that, a philosophy to explain how we can have apodictic uh, judgments, conclusions in, in the natural sciences, wanting to do that within the spheres of the historical um, that, that becomes this ideal in the course of the 19th century. And, and that's why Dilty's project is a critique of historical reason, uh, which will, will be, you know, for, would do for the, the, the social sciences, um, the sciences of textuality and of the historical dimension of existence. Uh, Dilty's critique of historical reason will do for those sciences what Kant's critique of pure reason um, did for uh, the natural sciences and justifying them. Uh, so now the other thing about that happens with this move to history, um, uh, well, and everything I just said then is, ri uh, is related to the rise of positivism um, as a philosophy, uh, which would be the the extension of the the understanding of the character of of the natural world um, being extended to cover all spheres of inquiry. Uh, 
Uh, so, um, and this is an, an attitude which is remains dominant today, uh, especially in Anglophone uh, communities. And that is, is that um, there's there's what's there's nature and there's what's natural, and then there's the supernatural. And what we've come to understand is, you know, the supernatural. There's reasons for its existence. Uh, you know, many of them related to people's, um, in some cases, gullibility; in other cases, their desperation or fear. Um, um, or, or even uh, some folks will say uh, things like um, 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 ideas like free will, which, which are not within the natural sphere, where you have a, a, a causal flux with some indeterminacy. There's no, no space with it, within that for free will. But nonetheless, that the idea of free will, um, even though it's in that sense a supernatural idea, is an essential idea for a functioning society. But, but nonetheless, we know when we think reasonably. So it's a good idea to have out there. It's not an idea you want to take apart uh, too quickly. Um, uh, and it might even be that functionally, we even people who know better have to kind of, you know, we're, we're conditioned um, and brought into an existence where a, a, a kind of a, a de facto affirmation of free will is part of how we think um, and, and, and a necessary part for moving around in our world and, and making making way around in the world, even though we know when we think logically that, that that's a supernatural idea. It's, it's not part of the sphere of nature, um, which is the sphere that modern science has unveiled for us. Um, and, um, we, um, and, and that's what positivism names, is, is that uh, ultimate reality is, is natural in kind, and, and we can discern um, the degree to which we uh, know what we know and, and only sentences that correspond um, in, 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 in directly, um, um, uh, 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 this all gets very complete, confusing, there's always objections coming to mind, but, but the idea is, is that only sentences which uh, come to mind and have some correlate in, in the natural world um, are, are part of what's ultimately real. Um, epiphenomenal sorts of realities like free will, which are, are real and they impact and influence within the sphere of understanding because we can be influenced by ideas which are not accurate, which are not actually true, but nonetheless they're powerful. Uh, those ideas, of course, we need to account for, we can track, we can see their influence, but, but we know they're not ultimately a part of the real character of reality, which is natural uh, nature in the modern sense of this grand flux um, that we all are kind of, um, you know, we're, we're points of consciousness within and we observe, we're aware of it, but it's it's just this grand flux. Again, uh, in, in incredibly complicated um, and uh, all interconnected, uh, moving along a causal um, way in which causation means prior trajectories, uh, determined future uh, results perhaps with some degree of indeterminism or pure, pure randomness built into the mix. Um, so um, the idea is is that um, philosophy's task should be to be able to explain everything ultimately in uh, natural terms and and where that's not possible to be self-conscious about the fact that you're dealing with epiphenomenal, uh, sorts of realities which, which have traction in the in in our world, our constructed historical world, um, you know, even though they're not ultimately part of the real, and a positivist philosophy will will have a sense of what's part of the real. Um, now, the other thing that comes up in the out of this period um, and in this period, which Ricoeur is going to refer to is is historicism in a sense, which is rejected, um, is the idea that that because history um, is another stream, another way of understanding a stream of reality, which proceeds in a way that's analogous to um, physical reality. So uh, this is a sense in which you have um, natural history, a museum of natural history. Uh, so so the other museum along this trajectory would be the museum of, of historical history, uh, the, you know, the museum of, of those things which are the products of not nature in its its uh, raw form, the sort of things you'd find in a museum of natural history, but the sort of things you'd find in other museums which are about um, various uh, products. Um, well, that's not a bad language, maybe, but, but things that are a product of uh, human intentionality. Um, and uh, this now is not just language, of course, but it includes, you know, foods, uh, 
fashion, uh, sculptures, uh, political forms, languages, um, books, poetry, art, uh, music, everything which is a function of intentionality, a function of, of, uh, of, an, of an author, um, all of that, the mores, the laws, the categories, the cultural forms, religions, uh, these massive systems of understanding which encompass us uh, and which carries us and within which any particular text or statue or stuff finds itself embedded, um, this is the reality which is historical history. Um, and again, uh, it's partly a product of human intentions. Um, 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 okay, let me just stop with that. So, um, History in Diltai's terms, then, is the most fundamental ex, uh, expression of life. Well, let me stay with my outline. Um, I'm pointing to where it is on my screen there. It's up here in the corner uh, for you, so maybe it's there. I'm not, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, where the next thing is, so we, that's emergence as history as a science. Um, and I'm going to talk about the particularly hermeneutical significance of that further in just a second. Um, but, but, and then the rise of positivism as a philosophy. Um, and these two things combine to give further impetus to and uh, a way of addressing the issue of, of, of getting a theory of knowledge for the historical realities that's uh, parallel in power and uh, in its foundation to uh, Kant's critique of pure reason, which, which had to do with uh, the natural realities and the natural sciences. So again, Diltai's critique of historical reason, which he never completed, but that was his ambition was to write it. And he, and he, he starts out, that's his ambition though, which, which then uh, is, is the, um, for the historical sciences, uh, the, the parallel to, to Kant's critique of pure reason in terms of establishing um, the natural sciences. Um, so the um, explanation understanding distinction uh, is related um, to these uh, two uh, sorts of history, uh, the natural history and all the investigations you'd find there, the things you'd find in astronomy or paleontology or biology or chemistry or physics. That's going to be the Natur Wissenschaften, which is just the sciences of nature. Wissenschaften is science, Natur is nature. Um, and then Geistes, which is, you know, spirit, the spiritual realm, but not now in the religious sense of spiritual, but in the sense of being a product of uh, the historical uh, dimension. So the Geistes Wissenschaften, uh, the sciences of the social. So the, this is, would be the social sciences or the human sciences, but still um, sciences. And, um, uh, and so this is uh, linked to uh, for, uh, what Dilty does uh, in terms of two sorts of understanding. Um, and so with, within, um, and, and this you want to look at the chart of, uh, that I have here, of, of, of Erlebnis, or the lived experience, was just kind of our raw, the, the, the raw edge of lived experience. Where right now you're looking at a computer screen, hearing my words, sitting on a chair, feeling some temperature. You may not be conscious of all the things that are affecting you, but just the lived moment of the edge of your experience, of each of our experiences, as, we, as me on the other side making this tape. That's the Erlebnis, where the air is kind of the intensifier of the living um, in the moment. Um, and, and to go down that column, the Air Levinus names the immediacy of life as we meet it. This is not quite in record, though he references this, but I think this will be helpful for understanding. And it's a unit held together by common meaning. We'll have to get back to that in a second. It's pre-reflexively given. It's not the content of an act of consciousness. It's, 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 that's what, it's, it's the living reality of the moment which surrounds me, out of which I act and think. Um, and in, in terms of my name, in terms of me naming it, which will be awestruck or expression, it's it's gonna that's where it becomes a unit held together by a common meaning. But in the sense that it's 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 what I already find myself embedded in, right? Physically, the chair I'm sitting in, um, it's it's uh, the, the the degree to which the the chair and I are in a relationship before I think it. Uh, that's the sense in which it's a realm before a subject and object. I'm not positing myself until I start talking and thinking a relationship between me and the chair. Before I even think that, I'm in this immediately lived relationship with the chair. If I bring my attention to it, I can feel the weight of my legs on the chair. I can feel whether the chair, the chair happens to be wooden. Maybe you're sitting on a cloth or, or other sort of a chair and you feel that difference. Um, and, and, but that 
once we reflect on it, becomes a relationship of subject to object. But before I start reflecting, already I'm in this relationship um, uh, to the chair. Um, th this now, in a sense, precedes me. It, it, uh, uh, when we get to Heidegger, what he means by erlebnis in some ways is lived experience. It's not as exact as in Heidegger, um, but it's, it's kind of what Heidegger means by the situation, the situation we find ourselves in, which is kind of this immediate given from which we think and act. It precedes any of our categorization. Um, Ausdruck is then the expression of this reality, um, in particular the expression of life, of, of erlebnis, right? So, so now not the analysis of the chair as I would do it if I were doing physics or um, uh, biology on a, you know, the impact of the chair on my legs and the, the, you know, how the blood is, is glows and how certain nerve ends and stuff like that. But the, it's the lived experience, my feeling of the tardiness of the chair, my feeling of discomfort as I get stiff over time, not the biological um, explanation or description of that, which is, is of course, uh, c completely valid, uh, but that's what that would be part of, 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 of uh, air clearing. That would be part of the scientific natural knowledge. But, it, but, it, but my lived experience is something other and different than that. Um, and this this takes um, form, um, not uh, not just in the simplistic example, but the degree to which I'm presently understanding myself as 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 um, um, an American, as um, a cisgendered male, um, as a uh, someone who's living in the 21st century. I mean, you can just go on uh, someone who's Christian. All these sorts of things are are there in their expressions in life, but all those things I just named, uh, religion. Um, uh, nationality, uh, gender, etc., um, and where am I placing myself in time and space? All these things are, are are parts of how I perceive myself, but they're expressions of life given to me uh, from um, the, the organization and history of all these fundamental ways of being in the world uh, that are that are then organized in terms of laws and social forms and language, uh, g the gestures I'm using, um, you know, all these sorts of means. So these expressions, uh, which are then the expressions of experience of, of lived life that are that are, that are put out there, then they become formed, they developed over time, they get their own sort of concreteness. Uh, these become then the objectification of mine. This is the character of their reality. They don't exist like the chair exists, but they're real and they're out there. They're not um, dependent just on me. Um, they're, they're, they're out there. So this is not a matter of the expression of, of, of introspection. It's not like I just turn inward. It's, it's the fact that in understanding myself in these terms, in these personal terms, the personal understandings by which I understand myself are given to me by the cultural forms and the language and the, the gestures, the clothing, everything else into which I find myself, um, uh, by which I find myself surrounded, and which are the cultural heritage of, of, of history, not natural history, but the, 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 the the history of the historical, or the historical is that which is what is created by a human intentionality um, uh, and, 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 and language. So, so art, um, art uh, in this sense, and here's the romantic coming back. Art is an expression in this sense of the histor hist social historical reality um, disclosed in experience, and it, it becomes in this way potentially the highest bearer of, of, of objective uh, truth. Um, and, and this is the elan vital of, of Romanticism, where what the Romantic poet is celebrated for, and this is going to shift in the 20th century, but in the, the 19th century, is, is discerning within the essence of life, the living, you know, vital essence of life that's there to be discerned, and what the great Romantic poet or painter or musician, you know, lit person, does, writer does, is they, they connect us to that reality. Um, and, and, and that's a sense in which that reality can be seen in, in that way as um, objectively uh, true. And, and the art in that sense doesn't point to the author and the author's intentionality, but to life itself in this sense. These, these realities of life, which are the expressions of life, which are captured um, in, um, in writing. Uh, in, in, and it doesn't have to be just writing. It can be, um, uh, it could be art. It could be music. It could be culinary, it could be fashion. Writing is where it's most um, you know, precise in many ways. 
Um, so elevenness, which then gives rise to expression, um, um, and I'll struck um, the lived experience, which gives rise to expression, but the lived experience itself is already dependent upon prior expression, right? So that's, I, I don't make up the terms uh, North American and cisgendered male. There are trajectories of the realization of the expressions in life and language, which, which give me access to these. Um, and, um, and then uh, these then become the objectification of mind. Um, and now not of, of individual minds, but of, of the, the mind itself, of, 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 of humanity. Um, th this is part of what uh, will give us historicism in the negative sense that Ricord talks about, is this idea that, that what you've got is, um, what historicism is saying is you, you've, you've, got, um, you've got an entity which is kind of the historical, which is mind, which is working in a parallel way to what you have in uh, the natural uh, sciences. So that just like in the natural sciences, you should be able to predict um, if you have you know, an eclipse, let's say, or something like that, you, you should also potentially ideally be able to predict a revolution or be able to understand, okay, what order of society uh, would allow us to uh, produce uh, the good, what's best. Um, and this sort of this sort of historicism, this sort of application of scientific method to human societies is things where uh, the human is plastic and the right society could um, uh, then uh, form the right sort of human and, and produce the ideal sort of society. This, this becomes embedded in Marxist um, uh, thought and the thought of Lenin and others who, um, um, of, co of course, this proves to be inaccurate and disastrous. Um, and, and so by the time Ricoeur is writing, when he's making these negative uh, comments about historicism, what he's critiquing in historicism is that sense of a historical determination, historical determinism um, that, that, that in part was um, what justified um, communist or Marxist thought in ways that, that clearly proved to be uh, devastating and misunderstanding. Um, okay, so, so this gets us to for staying, which is to understand or to know in the sense that we understand uh, historical realities, which is different than the way we understand, for instance, uh, the, the, the relationship between the sun and the earth, uh, or, the, or the, the, the character of a rock or something like that. So the, when we explain nature, so explain there is that word air clarin, it's a certain sort of knowledge. We explain nature. We explain how and why the Earth um, goes around the sun in a certain way. We explain volcanoes. We explain tsunami. Um, that's an, those are explanations of things that are fundamentally other. That they're not. They're not human. They're not living. They don't have. They're, they're, they're so so that's explanation, and that's the sort of explanation you have in the um, natural sciences, the Natur Wissenschaften. Uh, but that's a different sort of knowing than you have when it comes to the sort of knowledge you have of other people um, or the knowledge of, of the Elan Vital, the, 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 the realities of, of life unveiled by the great poets and painters and other artists. It's, it's different than understanding in the sphere of the social or human sciences because there we're understanding, uh, we're understanding other people. Uh, we're understanding um, um, products of, of intentionality. We're understanding that which is fundamentally like us, right? So we explain nature, but people we can understand. Um, and the, the phrase is, life understands life. That, that's what we're getting back to, is this life understands life. And you can see a parallel to that thing, that, that Schleiermacher, that I, discourse, you know, you have an idea, it's realized in discourse, um, and then in X, and then you want to get that X, so it pr reproduces in you the same idea. Well, one way that's possible was because that person and I are both persons. Um, that's going to be fundamentally different than me understanding, um, uh, let's say, um, a volcano from that period. Uh, so, but like understands like. Now we're, we're going to add to that in just a second, that Schleiermacher diagram. Um, so um, there was a pre-reflexive transposition of oneself into the other person where one rediscovers or discovers oneself. Um, um, so so um, the root of, of Diltai's distinct between the Natra and the Geistes of Wissenschaften is this distinction between um, explanation, which is part of the Naturwissenschaften, the natural sciences, where we like that, we understand that, we, we, 
know that, eclaron, that which is different than ourselves, right? The, the sort of knowledge we have in physics or chemistry or um, uh, astronomy or something like that versus where we're understanding um, other acts of intentionality, other civilizations, other people, other customs, other laws, other religious identifications, where, where we're understanding other people who are fundamentally like us. This, this is then the sciences of the spheres of spirit, of the historical. Again, not spirit in the religious kind of sense, but, but spirit in the sense of, of the way in which we uh, trans, you know, transcend and interact in a way that's just not the sort of thing, according to things you wouldn't find in the Museum of Natural History. Um, so, so, so there is uh, that. This gives us a distinction between um, the natural sciences and the human sciences. Uh, Diltai is the one who really comes up with this and gives it a logic. Um, now, today this might seem familiar to you because even you know today in most universities you will have the university organized in terms of the natural sciences um, in the social sciences. Uh, this is a product of Diltai. This is where you know these things, these ways of ordering and um, uh, organizing knowledge um, uh, is, you know, they're not just given, they're products of history in this sense. Um, and if you want to understand why we have this organization of knowledge, which would have been, you know, utterly alien to anyone living in the day of Calvin, um, there would be analogs, but not not in the same uh, sense. The difference there'd be a different understanding. This is we're studying this history of ideas, which leads us to sort reality and sort knowledge in these familiar ways. It's easy for us, if we're ignorant of this history, to think the way we sort reality and knowledge is just given. It's just no other way to do it. Uh, but one of the things that um, historicism or the realization of, the, the, of, of history or maybe most accurately hermeneutics, because historicism uh, has that negative connotation, that negative meaning it had, um, is to recognize that these things are not given, uh, that they are products of these deep trajectories. Uh, that doesn't mean they're false. Uh, it, it, or maybe not even it may not be incredibly useful. They might be very accurate, but but if they're problematic, they're not given. Uh, there might be other better ways of sorting or understanding reality. Um, okay, so um, so his, this gives us historicism also. I think uh, in the sense of historical consciousness, or what I think historicism has kind of come to mean in in kind of popular discourse because. We're pretty much beyond the, the sort of mechanistic historicism uh, that was um, the concern um, that, that uh, Ricoeur um, was, was uh, critiquing and negative about when he wrote this back in the early 70s, uh, that sort of historicism that was kind of sort of a social determinism, which, which lent itself within political theory to the idea that you could you know, diagnose and construct the ideal society, which, which turned out to lead to you know, had devastating consequences. I think that's pretty much gone today, um, in large part in terms of by historicism, what we mean more is just the recognition of a historical consciousness, a, a, a recognition of the way in which we are products of, 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 of a history, a contingent a history, a way of sorting things which is not a given, it's not necessary. Um, again, that doesn't mean that it's not uh, useful, um, accurate, maybe even in a certain sense is uh, true, but it's it's not simply the only way to sort reality, which which until you kind of have a, this historical sense, it's easy to uh, think that's what's going on. So, um, uh, Dilty along these lines, it's a slightly different move, but just to, to note it as we're here, it's on the bottom of that uh, uh, sheet I have there with the Erlebnis, Ausdruck, and Verstehen. Um, he also first developed the idea of, of Weltenschauung, um, where Welt is the world and, 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 and Schauung. I'm not sure I'm saying that German right. I apologize to any German speakers. Um, but it's in English we say worldview or worldviews. And this, this too is something that might, you might take as a very common idea, the idea that you can have a complete worldview that's internally coherent, but it sorts the world in a way that's different than another worldview, which is also completely coherent. Um, but but is distinct and and you can understand the two different points of view. You just can't affirm both of them as true simultaneously because they sort reality in ways that, that are not commensurable. And there's no meta world view available 
which allows you to put the two worlds. So you 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 are stuck with a contrast uh, between worldviews, and even below that logical level, there's a sense that, that that we are brought up in different societies, and so we quite naturally have different worldviews. And, and this is this goes together with that kind of historical consciousness, which is, you know, I've talked about in terms of you know if you in terms of the you, I mean, it, you know, it's hard to say what the, the you is there, what's the same, but, but but let's put that aside for a second. If you would happen to be born um, of a different uh, a gender uh, or sex in, um, you know, and so instead of, instead of me being born in the 20th century as a cisgendered male, American, raised Christian, if I'm born in the 7th century, a cisgendered female, of course, that language wouldn't have made difference, made sense in that time to most folks. It wasn't an available vocabulary, right? Um, in, in as raised as a Buddhist in Tibet, uh, you know, then I would think and see the world very differently. It's it's not just that I would somehow end up thinking the way I do now, and the way I do now is very different than I'd be, if I'd been born into a hundred or a thousand different circumstances, either at different times or today in different places, raised up. So this is the, the contingency of where you happen to find yourself, um, to use some language we're going to get to later with, with Heidegger, thrown into existence, coming up into the lived experience in an immediacy, but, but in the midst of expressions of life, which are very different than the ones that we happen to have been brought up um, into. And, and then we're going to understand in our, uh, ourselves and our worlds very differently. This is a very common way of thinking of a worldview and, and recognizing the historical contingency of it and, and the fact that you'll never be able to uh, step out of it. Uh, this, this becomes part of what in the long run is going to take apart the idea of a critique of historical reason, right, of a science of this sort of understanding of the sort that Tiltai himself wanted. So he's he, he's he's both has the ambition, it's this, this classic 19th century ambition, to turn history, to give a scientific basis uh, for history and historical understanding. But as he impacts the character of historical understanding, he actually makes visible um, in ways maybe he never completely um, um, understood because he never abandoned his project. He just never could bring it to completion. And I think that speaks to the rigor of his thought. He didn't try to draw premature conclusions. And so what we have from Diltai are all sorts of unfinished ideas and unfinished manuscripts. Nonetheless, he's such a significant figure that most of us sort reality, even though we don't know it, in Diltian terms, right? So we talk and think in terms of worldviews. We talk about the natural and social sciences. All of that is um, the legacy of Diltai. All right, so um, that's the um, significance of expressions of life. So objectification, self-interpretation, self-knowledge. Now, along the lines of, of, of objectification, I think lines of this, remember with Schleiermacher we had the two figures, and this guy has the thought or has, of X, and, and, and that wants to bring that to discourse, so, so says X, um, or uh, let's go ahead and, and, and put it here to, to get that. Uh, it puts X in this, and then the whole point of that is to have this person over here, right, read the X, this X, and to have that act of discourse, that speech event, uh, produce the exact same thought, uh, the idea, the same experience, which, uh, uh, which the X, which produced the X in the first place. So that this X, you know, what we're looking for in understanding is for this X, to correlate perfectly uh, with this x, right? Or since we know we can't do that perfectly, even even uh, early on, what with relative universe, you know, you know, you know, a relatively univocal understanding, right? So so maybe not exactly exact in the sense that no a uh, equals a. So that's that you know this a is over here, this a is over here, this a is here, this a is here, this a is older than this a. I mean, so it, strictly speaking, a never equals a. Uh, this is the whole you can't step in the same stream twice, uh, or even better, you can't even step into the same because it's not the same once, because same produce, same assumes that identity, which, which we don't have. So, so uh, you get from uh, A to A, um, and um, so, so, but still, nonetheless, that's the ideal. We're, that we're trying to get to the act of thought which produced the discourse or the text and, and to get that back, right? So, so, but what in the world, where does this uh, act of thought, this understanding, come from? That, that is left uninterrogated um, in Schleiermacher. 
right? So even once you're looking and you say, oh, I got to deal with context and history, what's the original context? What does X mean in Greek? And, 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 and I am reading it in English in translation, so I've got to go back and I've got to understand the Greek and its relationship to other Greek and contemporary texts and uh, the person's life and their social setting. I have to do all this work to get back to what X this X meant uh, so that I can get back to what they thought when they said X, right? So all of that's there already in Schleiermacher. But what's not interrogated at all is, you know, what in the world is this X? How does it come to be? And what's where does this come from, right? And what we realize with everything we've just said, it comes out of everything I just said, is, is this X comes from out here. This person has had an experience of life which, which correlates to experiences of life that have been had and they've been uh, put into, so, so, no, so not just X, but all these other people back here, right, who are fixing their experiences of life in writing. I mean, this is huge masses of people going back this direction, filling all of time, and, and, and then you have this particular person emerge out of some, you know, right, of all humans, all human history prior, some subset uh, out of which this person has emerged, right? And this person has the experience of life, and they don't just get to invent language themselves and just say anything. The way they understand themselves will be dictated by the language games, the, the various vocabularies in the broadest possible sense, including customs and dietary diet and, and fashion and gestures, all of that, uh, that they have been raised into. In other words, this X that this person says is not theirs. They've gotten it first from out here in this public realm. And, and that is how there's going to be some hope for Diltai to have something objective because this realm out here is public and we both, you know, we are both participating in it. And it may, I have to may still do all that work to get back to what this X meant, but I'm no longer trying to figure out what's going on in the head of this person because this person themselves is understanding themselves in accord with the X that they've received from prior history. And that's a historical trajectory that I'm in line with. So now this X in this text, which is also influenced by all the other texts, everything else is flowing through history to us, right? This flow of history is what's subjective. In a sense, it's this piece of paper suddenly, which is theorized as history. And, and, and maybe there's another piece of paper under it, which is the natural history, which interacts with it to some degree. But in terms of the histor history as a science, history is an un interconnected whole. That's the piece of paper itself uh, being theorized and that's where this person gets their X, and that's how I have hope of understanding X like they did, because it turns out that both they and I, insofar as we are going to understand ourselves in relationship to X, we have to understand ourselves in relationship to all of history and what X means, uh, which, which means that our self-understanding now is mediated through this public understanding, the, the historicality, historicity into which we're born, the patterns, the textuality within which we're born. That's, you know, that is the expressions of life fixed in writing through which we come to understand ourselves um, just as much as the other. So this is the possibility of, 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 of some objectification. Because now you're looking at an objective reality, the reality of history as an interconnected whole, which, which not only comes prior to me, but determines how I understand myself. And, and so now there's a possibility that since that understanding is public, that, that for some objectification, because now my self-interpretation, I don't know myself immediately and given as true. I know myself and understand myself in the categories that have been given to me. I understand myself more and more thoroughly as I understand that. Just like I was saying before, this is why you think of natural and social sciences. It's because of Dilty, right? It's not just given to you. You understand yourself through that, let alone all, you know, cisgendered male or cisgendered female or not, right? Uh, or not even breaking that to male or female. Let's add the third. There's other possibilities. Understanding ourselves in those ways um, necessitates kind of expressions of life being fixed in writing. Um, and and, and, and you, you with that. So that's the sense in which uh, self-knowledge is also tied to this objectively. It gives you that objective moment, right? But then we're going to see the aporia arise in the same sort of a way because to the degree I understand myself as a type or a kind, just an occasion in the flux of history, which is a product of all these understandings, I've become objectified. 
and and so so the 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 aim of interpretation there or the, the what we get in terms of interpretation is the what what is expressed by the text which we have objectively because it's this what of history but if the aim of interpretation is the who the uniqueness that 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 I which is not simply a product uh, you know and it, and for many people they just drop that who right that becomes a magical supernatural thought in itself but that is not uh, where Delta is or Schleiermacher again there's not an argument for this it's just their ambition they want that who and and so this is where uh, you get the aporia like you had in Schleiermacher but now developed at a far more sophisticated level where the the you get a science of interpretation insofar as you can objectify interpretation and get a what but insofar as you get a what then I'm not a who I'm just an occasion uh, for a uh, um, the confluence of these various causal streams at the level of language and traditions and customs and gestures that are carried at the level of of, of, of nurture in in contrast to the level of nature right or or means versus genes which is a little bit you know um, that's a little less precise so the nature nurture you can think of where this is all the nature uh, and all the nurture other stuff coming together in all of the different ways which determines whom I am which combined with nature gives a complete explanation of my what but somehow in that I become just a node of consciousness in the flux a, a confluence a point of confluence from which I see but in no no significant sense of who that's where the aporia uh, reasserts itself okay I think I'm going to stop with that um, oh I wanted to do or I did the drawing okay so I'm going to stop with that okay